Welcome. Good morning. Bom dia. Did I say that right? I, my Portuguese is a little out of practice, but uh, good morning. Um, welcome. It, we're here to talk about open source security, and if you're not here to talk about that, you're in the wrong room. So I won't. You won't hurt my feelings if you leave now. If you leave later, it might hurt my feelings. But anyway, um, <laughs> welcome. My name is Jillian. I started my own company a few years ago called Gold Hat Security, and I do this, and there's a little bit of an echo. Is there an echo for you guys, or just me? Huh? I'm going to stand back a little bit. Wait, is this, is this better? That's better. Okay. Um, so I do basically this. I teach developers about security and secure coding best practices, and I love it. And I'm a little out of practice because of pandemic. But anyway, um, I've spent 13 years now working in application security. And we should have done a sound check. Is it good? OK. Um, so I spent 13 years working in application security. Before that, I was a developer. So it's been a little while since I was full-time writing code. But I'm still one of you, I promise. Um, and before. Before the pandemic, I also did stand-up comedy. So um, just, I will try to make you laugh, but it's very hard to write jokes about code, just, just so you know. But I'm going to try. I will try to make you laugh. And um, I also love to travel. And here I am in Portugal. So thanks for having me. All right, moving right along. You don't care about me. Let's talk about code. Um, so there's a very common myth that I would like to dispel, first and foremost, before we get too far. Um, that open source software is secure because more people are looking at it. And that assumes that there's a lot of people who are very, very bored, who have nothing better to do than look at open source code. So um, in theory, yeah, sure, that would be great. But in reality, um, oftentimes open source code isn't very well maintained or not maintained at all. And like any software, it's often written without security in mind. So it's just something to keep in mind. Um, just because it's open doesn't necessarily make it more secure. Sometimes it is, and sometimes it isn't. So we'll get more into that. So the potential impact. I'm willing to bet that you can guess the package that I'm going to name is the best example. I can't hear you. Sorry. Yes. Yes, that's the one. Uh, Log4j. and. I, I think that this is going to be the best example of what can go wrong for probably many years to come. Um, and if you're sitting in this room, I'm sure that you were involved or at least aware of it and had to deal with that. So I'm not going to drone on and on and on about it. Um, but for the people playing at home on YouTube, uh, we'll just we'll cover the, the highlights. Um, so anyway, remote code execution, really bad. No need to authenticate. So if you have remote code execution, that means you can send code and execute it on the remote server. Um, multiple updates to fix the darn thing. So there was probably a lot of vendors and customers calling saying, which patch did you apply? And when did you apply it? And blah, blah, blah. So that was a mess. Um, the, the technical term for this is really, really, really bad. It was bad. So. It's the best example I have. It's going to be the best example for a while. So, um, Other things to keep in mind. Um, basically, it, it's still software. Just because it's open doesn't mean there's anything special. Anything that can go wrong with regular software is going to go wrong with open source software, too. Um, can impact your uptime. So if there's a denial of service, vulnerability or an infinite loop, something in that code uh, that can Im impact your uptime. Uh, impacts to confidentiality of data. You can have all sorts of security vulnerabilities, uh, you know, SQL injection, cross-site scripting, all, all the big ones. And it can impact the integrity of your data. So if your data is not correct, that's going to be a mess to fix also. Um, so now that we've covered that, we're all on the same page. Um, what are you going to do when you go to choose an open source library? Um, 
some questions that I want you to be thinking about when you go to pick, it, pick out a new library. Does this library have any known vulnerabilities? So I don't know how many of you go and check that now. Um, I know a lot of the developers I've worked with typically just say, does this do the thing I want it to do? Yes, download. So we're gonna just add a few more questions to the process. Um, does it have a history of known vulnerabilities? Because even if it doesn't have any right now, if it has in the past, it might again in the future. Is it widely used? That's a double-edged sword. And how often is it updated? So, if you're taking notes, I'll give you a second. <laughs> um, so this website is really, really useful for looking up if it has any known vulnerabilities. So you wanna go to cve.mitre.org and click on that button right there. So the CVE list search, and you can just search the package that you're looking at. And what it'll come up with it looks a little something like this. I'm picking on log4j because it's the best example. Um, so what you see here is there's 19 known vulnerabilities. And for as long as it's been around, that's actually not too bad. But you might notice that the most recent ones are all from this year. And the big mess was last year. And I think that they're just finding more vulnerabilities now because there's more people looking at it. It's like, it's become more of a high profile thing. Um, so the 2022 just means this year. So um, you wanna click through each one of these and just make a note of how severe these vulnerabilities are. Now we all know the one from last year was like a 9.8 or a 10. It's so on a scale of one to 10. So 10 is really, really bad. Three is probably fine. So just make a note of that. Um, now, the next question you wanna ask is, is this being widely used? So if a package is being widely used, in theory, it means it's been tested more, it's been looked at a little more. Hopefully we've found the vulnerabilities. But on the other hand, if more people are using it, then it becomes more of a valuable target for attackers. So hmm, it's a factor in your decision-making process, but in either case, it doesn't guarantee that it's gonna be secure. So um, next up, I have a little audience participation just to see if you're awake. Has everybody had their coffee? Okay, so um, just a few red flags that I would look for. I have a few examples. Um, this one, I was specifically looking for security type open source packages for my examples here, because it says security, it's gonna be secure, right? No. Um, so um, anybody see the red flag on this one? Yes. And, and there's only one version. They put out the first version and never updated it again. So that would be a no. Now, do I know if there's definitely a security vulnerability in this? No, I mean, it might be fine, but I guarantee if there is a vulnerability, they're not going to fix it because they, they probably just moved to Bali or something. Like, they're never coming back to update this. So, now the next example I picked on PHP SecLib, which I haven't used personally, but it's an encryption package for PHP. Now, the latest release was 23 days ago. That's not too bad. Right? Um, but if we scroll down a little bit, I see something that I find kind of concerning, and I'll let you volunteer if you see it too. Sorry? Mm -hmm. That's a lot um, for an encryption package 116 contributors, and like at least one is anonymous. Um, so I, I doubt that all of those people are experts in cryptography. So crypto is something that's really, really easy to get wrong. And seeing that number of contributors is kind of, not a red flag, but like an orange flag. You know, it's, it's concerning. Um, so I would take another look at that one before, you know, okaying it. Um, and again, all of this is without actually looking at any code. So it's just kind of a high level 
quick decision making metric kind of thing. You know, you can definitely go look at the code if you want, but that takes time. Um, this one, they make it kind of easy for you. That's no longer being maintained. So, uh, but see, the per day average for that is still 3,000 people. So obviously some pe people are still using it, but it's no longer being maintained. So that would be a, that would be a nope. Um, all right, so that's that one. Uh, so the takeaway is that there's a lot of different factors to consider when you're choosing an open source package. Um, known vulnerabilities, history of the package and how many vulnerabilities they've had in the past, popularity kind of a factor and update frequency now if you really wanted to you could sit down with a security expert and review the code of every package that you download but i'm guessing that you don't have the time to do that so these are quick quick checks so um moving right along just to make you slightly more paranoid, um, nested dependencies. So it's not just the libraries that you use, but the libraries that they use, and then the libraries that those libraries use, and so on and so forth in times infinity. Um, so here's a really, really oversimplified example. Um, but if you have lots and lots of different dependencies and there's a vulnerability in one, depending on how that code is used, it could make your application vulnerable as well. So, um, that, that was a quick one, but the takeaway is that nested dependencies can have an impact as well. Um, and just by the way, this is a brand new talk, so if you see any typos, let me know. I, <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I'm getting to that because some of the tools will look at nested dependencies, so but some of them. So it's only evaluating the tools. You could do that manually if you want to, but that's going to take you forever. I would not recommend that. <laughs> it's just, yeah. Because, like I say, that's a really oversimplified example, and you could be looking at thousands of thousands of, of like nested dependencies. Um, so hold on, I'm gonna get a drink of water real quick. <laughs> okay. All right. So updates. Um, this is a bit of a contention point. So I've been working in application security for a while. And um, oftentimes when I'm working with developers and there's a library that's out of date, the, the reason why we can't update it is, oh, well, that breaks something. And okay, well, if it breaks something, then can we fix it? Because the vulnerability is also, you know, it's wildly out of date. Um, so anyway, just I, I don't know um, how you guys are doing with keeping things up to date, but if you're not making an effort, which you should be, so that's the moral of the story. Um, even if your libraries are up to date, they can still have vulnerabilities. So uh, a zero day vulnerability is what that's called. The log4j mess uh, was a zero day vulnerability because we had zero days warning. That's why it's called that. Um, this is a really important bullet point. They put a star next to it. Um, have a plan to execute quickly if you need to, like, if there's another emergency patch. Like, assume that log4j will happen again with some other package somewhere. So, um, this, I was going to mention this back on that first slide. Um, but I, like I say, have been doing this for 13 years. So, my career is a teenager. And I don't mean to, but I've become a little bit jaded and cynical because I've been doing this for 13 years. So just teenager attitude about security. So when log4j came out, I was not surprised. In fact, I was just like, uh-huh, yeah. Like it was bound to happen eventually. So um, 
I, I don't mean to, you, you all look really worried now. Sorry, sorry. I just, I've been doing this for a while and I know that software is never gonna be completely secure. Now, is there remote code execution in all of them? No, hopefully not. But um, I would assume that there probably is in some of them and we just haven't found it yet. So not to make you super nervous, but anyway, the point is to have a plan to execute quite quickly if you need to apply an emergency patch. Yep. Um, bonus points, you get a gold star if you can do this automatically. So. Um, the, the takeaway I want you to take away from this is that updates aren't optional. You all still with me? Okay. <laughs> um, now, I'm talking about tools. This is kind of the best and only solution we have without manually reviewing tons and tons and tons of lines of code. Um, so the tools that we have to take care of open source security is called software composition analysis. And it's different than the tools that you're probably already using. So static code analysis doesn't necessarily find vulnerabilities in your open source unless you've specifically set it up to scan open source, which you probably haven't. Um, and then dynamic testing might find a few things, um, but still I wouldn't, wouldn't promise it. So it's just, it's another tool to add to your list of things to buy. Um, but it can help you manage the security of open source. So I have a few paid options for you, and this is not an endorsement or like a complete list of any kind, but um, SNCC is great. Um, Sonatype, Nexus Lifecycle, I haven't used, but um, it's one to check out. Uh, White Source, Black Duck, Veracode and Checkmarks both have software composition analysis tools. It's different from the static analysis. So um, don't worry, there's free tools too. Hold on, with the picture taking. <laughs> just, <laughs> I'm almost there, I'm almost there. Okay, so uh, free tools though. So you don't have to spend money. GitHub has some good options to notify you of bad packages. Um, Active State Platform, Shift Left Core, and in, this is specific to NPM, but NPM Audit um, is another free option. Um, by no means is this an exhaustive list if your favorite tool is not on there. Hit me up, I'll change the slides, like it's brand new talk, so. <laughs> um, now, I, I do wanna give a caveat about this, is the way that most of these work is working off of a database, like the one I showed you at the beginning, the website, the CVE database. Um, most of them might actually be using that database. And I know that at least, last time I checked, Black Duck does their own research to find those vulnerabilities and then report them to that central database. So it's only finding known vulnerabilities. There is still that hidden aspect to it of like there might be something waiting, like what happened with Log4j. Like it's, there, there could be something that we don't know about, but these will find things that we do know about. And uh, most of the tools, if not all of them, should tell you if your packages are out of date, which should be a red flag, so. Um, I wish I had a really super awesome, like, cure-all solution, um, but this is, it's a relatively new problem in security, and it's one that we're still working on fixing. So, yeah. Um, how to choose? Which tool? How do you choose which tool? There's so many options, and there's, like, more than I could fit on the slide. Um, but there's different things that you want to think about, and it's going to be... Obviously, you want it to handle all the different languages you're using. It's kind of a given. Um, does it look at nested dependencies? Not all of them do. So that's why I made that slide. Um, how quickly is their database updated? So from somebody reporting something to the CVE database um, to their own tool being updated, there might be a bit of a lag. So something to think about. Um, do they do their own vulnerability research? So if they do, that gives you a little bit of a head start over everybody else. 
And this one, super duper important, I would put the star next to this one, is does it integrate with your current deployment process? Because if it doesn't, you're probably not going to use it. So. All right. Um, this is your main takeaway. I can also go back to any slides you want if we didn't get pictures. It just, just let me know. <laughs> okay. So, but software composition analysis tools. Um, I want to just throw up a slide about licensing. This is not necessarily a security thing. It's just something that can get you into trouble. Um, and a lot of those tools will let you know if you have potential licensing issues. But there's as many different licenses as you can imagine. These are some of the common ones. Um, and there's just certain legal implications to the different licenses. And the moral of the story is, um, when in doubt, ask a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer, and I'm certainly not an international lawyer. So we're in Portugal, where the rules are probably different. I, I don't know. Don't ask me. I'm, like, I'm, I'm bad at licensing. Ask a lawyer. Cool? Um, OK. And then I just, you can take a picture of this one. Um, so the, those first two are vulnerability databases. And then the safe log4j tool, if you're still worried about log4j, it's a free tool. Um, and I really super duper apologize that this is supposed to be an hour talk and I've used like 22 minutes. <laughs> so um, I am perfectly willing to take questions. Um, or you could go get coffee. Yes, questions. I love questions. Yes. Yes. Um, if if I were looking at a package that had like one vulnerability and it was like a medium. And it, and it was patched. Yeah, being patched quickly is is definitely a factor. Um, but if I see, uh, sort of, yeah, because you can expect vulnerabilities in yeah. anything. Um, but a pattern of like lots of highs and criticals would be mm, they maybe don't know what they're doing. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's a good question. But. Um, if, if they're waiting for a month to, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I'm understanding your question. <laughs> I'm guessing you'd want to do some testing, yeah, to make sure that it doesn't break anything and it hasn't made things worse. Um, that's, that's up to you. But for things that are critical, so like a 9 or 10 on the, CV, on the vulnerability scale, um, I would maybe throw caution to the wind a little bit to patch those. It depends on the severity of the vulnerability. Yeah. Um, if there's not a vulnerability patched in a certain release, then I suppose you don't have to update it, no? I, like From a security perspective, I wouldn't care. But from a functionality perspective, you might want to. Yes. It's true. That, that's a good point. Yeah. So this is why I say gold star for automatic updates. You know, um, but it just, it depends. I, I know everybody's busy and everybody has lots of work to do. So dealing with, you know, patching updates and uh, security fixes and things like that, like it's, 
you have to balance that with all the other work you have to do and uh oh sorry yay <laughs> um so i i really should have just like put more content on the slides i'm really sorry i just um brand new talk <laughs> but um is there anything that like, this is an opportunity for you to give me feedback, too. Like, is there something I should have covered and didn't? Um, can go into more detail on anything you want, but it's just not in slide format. So. Mm-hmm. Right. There's also a licensing issue with that too, sometimes. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, again, ask a lawyer. Um, I just, I know that that would be a thing that I would ask the lawyer about. Um, but yes, if you, if you copy and paste from somebody else's code, then yeah, you're not gonna get the updates, which could potentially be a security issue down the line. But yeah, I mean, there's there's branches and forks of things all over the place. So it's I know people do it, but it's it's a factor to consider. And I think the moral of the story is that open source is a really complicated problem, and I wish I had a good solution for it right now. But there's, I you know maybe I'll like I'll work on that and make a million dollars, but. Um, it's, there's a lot of really smart people working on the problem. It's just, it's complicated and the more people use it, the more complicated it gets. So. Do you think things like a, uh, GitHub. It's a code like machine learning thing, but basically you mm -hmm. put it in like a right lane of system. It just goes, hey, I found a bunch of code on the GitHub that I think is a system that's just to happen quickly. I could see how that would add some new security issues. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. So advice on large companies and lots and lots of code and packages to manage. Um, I, my advice would be to try out some of the tools and see how they work for you. Um, I, I've been in real, like real impressed with the work that they've done. And I'm sure that the last time I looked at them was like three years ago. So I'm sure that there's even more updates now. Um, but with the tools and the reporting that you can, you can, you can quickly see which ones are out of date, which ones are vulnerable. Um, which ones might have licensing issues, and it solves that problem for you. But yeah, um, I don't know if that helps, but just large scale, automate everything you can. <laughs> so, um, okay. Well, we've officially used half an hour of the hour time. I, I really am sorry. I can tell you jokes if you want for half an hour, but <laughs> I just, like, I wish there was, there was more to cover. Um, but yeah, let's, let's go get coffee. <laughs> and if you have any questions, let's come find me later. Just look for the curly hair. So thank you.